Is China alone in the whole world? Let's think about it, but it's probably not even worth trying. This question has been troubling for 50 years, and there is still no clear answer. Inside China, it is better not to touch this topic at all. There, it is considered to be a purely internal Chinese issue. Even in the United States, the situation is not so simple. On the one hand, there is the Taiwan Relations Act of 1979 and the Taiwan Relations Strengthening Act of 2020. Despite the Americans' One China policy even calls by U.S., officials to Taiwan are rare. American companies such as Blizzard severely penalize and fire employees for any negative mention of Hong Kong and Taiwan. How did this situation come about and where did the Beijing Taipei standoff begin? Again. Brace yourselves, friends. We will answer this question in the next couple minutes. Usually the story begins in 1949, but we'll go even deeper all the way back to the 8th millennium BC. At that time, known as the Neolithic period, the Austronesians lived in Fujian province. This group got their name from their language and were quite advanced for their time. It is believed that they were among the first to invent sailing technology and they had a primitive analog of paper. They practiced mostly agriculture and made some progress, but closer to the 5th millennium BC, they encountered the more numerous Sino-Tibetan peoples, also known as the Tibeto-Chinese. This was the beginning of the migration known as the Austronesian Expansion, a historical event that left a mark on history. First of all, the ancient people moved from eastern China to Taiwan, which was unfamiliar to them, as the first Austronesian settlements on the island date back to 8,000 years BC. Then, thanks to their technological advancement, the Austronesians populated the entire oceanic world. Their descendants are found in Indonesia, the Philippines, Polynesia, and even Madagascar. Of particular importance to us is Taiwan, where Austronesians became the ancestors of the island's natives. As of 2020, more than half a million Taiwanese are direct descendants of ancient Austronesians. Before the beginning of our era, China did not show much interest in the island, but the Taiwan Strait and the geographical position of the island could not go unnoticed. As early as the 3rd century aid, Taiwan is mentioned in Chinese chronicles as an island of barbarians. In 239, mainland China sent a 10,000-strong expeditionary corps to the island. In 605, the operation was repeated and the natives were brought back to the mainland where they were taught Chinese and used in negotiations. There is little information from those times, but it is known that in the 7th century there were already villages established by both mainland Chinese and Japanese on the Penghu Islands and Taiwan. Like Chinese pirates, Japanese pirates preferred to use Taiwan as a base, although this was a dangerous endeavor. The natives of Taiwan were militant, and for grooms, marriage required bringing the head of a Chinese elder as proof of maturity. The Mongols who came to power in China in the 13th century also did not neglect violence, and during the Yuan Dynasty, the Penghu Highlands and part of Taiwan came under the control of the mainland. This stimulated a wave of migration from less favored areas to the islands. Since then, the process of pushing the aboriginal Taiwanese closer to the mountains began, while mainland Chinese, descendants of migrants from Fujian and Guangdong provinces, occupied the most fertile land and made up the majority of the population of modern Taiwan. Like the rest of the planet, however, and Taiwan had to contend with European colonizers. In 1517, the Portuguese passed by the island, giving it the name Formosa, which translates to beautiful. Later, the Dutch of the East India Company arrived on the island, and Taiwan ceased to be part of the Chinese equation in the confrontation between the Spanish and the Dutch. The Dutch were victorious, but their complete control of the island lasted only 20 years. During that time, however, they had a significant impact on Taiwan's history, helping Chinese migrants displace the local natives and introducing the use of cattle to work in the fields, as well as various types of fertilizer. In addition to the above, the Dutch left behind educated natives in Taiwan who could write. However, it should be remembered that, as with other colonies, the Europeans were mainly interested in profit, so rebellions were common. One of these in 1662 resulted in the Ming Dynasty taking over Taiwan, the earliest time in history that a colony was completely taken from the Europeans and the first documented instance of Taiwan being declared an independent state. After the Ming Dynasty on the mainland was replaced by the Qing Dynasty, fugitive generals and residents founded the Duning State on the island, which was known in Europe as the Kingdom of Formosus. However, it did not last long. In 1683, the Manchus of the Qing Dynasty, with the help of the Dutch and sanctions, regained control of Taiwan. 
From then until 1895, the island was under the full control of mainland China. However, there were some nuances here. First, the Qin Empire did not take Taiwan seriously, viewing it as the backyard of China. Second, much of the island's population adhered to the traditions of the Ming Empire and resisted the Qin, considering them invaders. Third, the Opium Wars began in the 19th century. Great Britain did not like China's independence and its reluctance to trade opium. As a result, the country put together a coalition and defeated the Qin dynasty forces, which led to famine, devastation, and drug addiction in the country. Taiwan became a convenient base for Western powers to conduct military and political actions against China. The island's trade with Europe and Japan increased dramatically, and when China came to its senses, it was too late. Despite this, the effort was laudable. In 1885, Taiwan was granted the status of a full-fledged province. Under the leadership of the Chinese government, the first railroad was built, ports and infrastructure were repaired. This period is remembered with warmth even by modern Taiwanese authorities. However, we will never know how history would continue, because in 1884 China and Japan went to war. Japan was victorious and, with Western support, seized Taiwan. Although China did not recognize the terms of the treaty, the island was the first step in colonial activity for the Japanese. Within a few decades, Taiwan became the most developed region in Southeast Asia, with the exception of Japan. In 1895, only 50 kilometers of railroads were laid on the island, but 10 years later, under the leadership of the Japanese, their number increased to 500. Taiwan was electrified, new agricultural technologies were introduced, and its economy became world-class by the beginning of World War I. It is worth noting, however, that the Japanese ruled the island very harshly. Even elections were only a passing phenomenon, where the governor general was appointed from among the locals. Nevertheless, before the outbreak of World War II, Japanese militarism began to prevail. Taiwan began to be assimilated and conscripted into the army on the side of Japan. How that ended you know. Many Taiwanese participated on the side of Japan in the Nanjing Massacre and other war crimes. However, most people in Taiwan were still glad to be back in China after the end of World War II. True, even there it was not without incident. Although Japan was apparently forced to give up Taiwan at the Damascus Conference, there were no sensible peace treaties until 1951. Furthermore, China was not even invited to sign the documents in San Francisco. China's rights to Taiwan were secured in a piecemeal fashion, effectively hanging the question of the island's statehood in the air. It was not only documents and treaties that were in disarray. Since early 1927, China had been in the midst of a civil war. The Republic of China and the Chinese Communists fought over territory and became the scene of confrontation between the great powers even before World War II. For example, in the 1930s, Germany supported the Republic and the USSR supported the Communists. Because of the war with Japan and the subsequent World War, the Chinese had little time for internal strife. But as soon as the situation improved, the old divisions returned. The Communists and Republicans immediately after Japan's surrender began fighting over cities and territories to emphasize the legitimacy of their government. The Civil War ended in victory for Mao Zedong and the Communists. Chiang Kai-shi and the Kuomintang fled to Taiwan, where a dictatorship was established from 1949. Chiang Kai-shi first declared the establishment of the Republic of China on the island, then imposed martial law. This martial law lasted 38 years and is considered the longest in history. It became known as the White Terror, under which many thousands of Taiwanese were arrested, tortured and executed for suspected collaboration with the Communist Party of mainland China. The island imposed total censorship, banned strikes, and actively reinforced Taiwan's defenses. The second half of the 20th century saw several active phases of confrontation. In 1955, 1958, and 1995, full-scale wars between the PRC and Taiwan nearly broke out. The U.S. has always played a decisive role in these events. Immediately after World War II, American specialists actively rebuilt the economy and made investments. Wolf Lidzinski carried out a successful agrarian reform, which led to defeudalization and the establishment of market relations. Labor-intensive industries were also developed, which the U.S protected with its military might. In 1979, the Taiwan Relations Act was passed, providing direct military support for the island in the event of a military clash with the PRC. Taiwan also spoke on behalf of China at the UN, 
Beyond formal support for the island, however, the great powers could not help but notice the PRC's growing capabilities. In 1971, mainland China took a seat at the UN, becoming China's sole representative. Taiwan repeatedly tried to challenge this and submitted its own applications, but they were rejected under pressure from China. U.S. rhetoric was also changing. Instead of clear and unambiguous support for Taiwan, a so-called policy of strategic ambiguity emerged. On the one hand, the U.S. and its allies support the island nation. Informal representations and organizations of Taiwan exist in almost all Western countries. However, no one formally recognizes them, and the U.S. officially recognizes the People's Republic of China as the sole legitimate representative of the Chinese people. This leads to complications, as in the case of a new law in 2020 to strengthen U.S. relations with Taiwan. On the other hand, the U.S. conducts all official negotiations with the PRC, prohibiting its companies from even mentioning the island's independence. The situation changes periodically depending on the current relations between the U.S. and China. However, the status quo established in the 1980s has largely been maintained to this day. China adheres to the concept of a unified country, while Taiwan seeks formal independence. The world is divided in its support for both China and Taiwan, and some seek to favor both sides by maximizing benefits, and there is much to fight over. Taiwan's economy has grown at one of the fastest rates in the world, and today it's a center for semiconductors, the electronics industry, and even nuclear power. The mainland China, of course, remains the island's main trading partner. Despite the fact that Taiwan does not make any tax or financial contributions to the Chinese treasury, the volume of mutual trade continues to grow from year to year. In parallel, the process of democratization of society on the island is also growing. Martial law was finally lifted in 1987, and direct presidential elections were held in 1996. By the early 2000s, the position of the Kuomintang, which had ruled the island for half a century, had also weakened. Tensions are now rising again in the region, and the explanation for the current situation probably lies in political factors. Thank you, dear friends, for joining me on this fascinating journey through history. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you don't miss new videos about exciting events and facts from the past. Also leave your comments below this video, I'm always happy to hear your thoughts, suggestions and requests for topics for future videos. See you all again on the channel.